So the Bible speaks about the existence of both good angels and fallen angels. How did the angels fall? Why did they fall? What is the consequences of their fall? That's what we're going to be talking about today in this video. I hope you'll stick around. So in part one of this series, I talked about false teachers. And one of the things that I noticed about the passages that talk about false teachers, especially the passage in Jude and also in 2 Peter chapter 2, is that they never specifically laid down any doctrine particularly that people needed to watch out for. There are doctrines that are bad, and other passages address some of those issues of um, the Judaizers and Gnostic beliefs and so on. But these two passages that I'm looking at today and that I looked at in the previous video in Jude and in 2 Peter chapter 2, false teachers and fallen angels are talked about in the same passage. So they're interspersed. Uh, the author will be talking about a false teacher, talk about fallen angels, talk about false teachers, more about fallen angels, and how there's uh, things that are kind of the same about both false teachers and fallen angels, and that primarily what we're looking at are character issues, <laughs> not so much specific doctrinal issues. There are all kinds of errors in doctrine, but character, who you are as a person, how, how you uh, live your life, this is a more objective way for people who don't know the answers to <laughs> all doctrinal questions looking at someone's life and whether or not they have the fruit of the Spirit, they're walking in the power of the Spirit, or whether they're living a life of carnality, and worse yet, whether they're leading someone else into a life of immorality and carnality and uh, pride and so on. So the Bible talks about fallen angels, talks about good angels, and we know that in the beginning when God made everything, everything was good. There wasn't any bad angel. There weren't any bad people or fallen um, entities. Every single thing, every single being that God made, he made good. He didn't make any of them evil. However, we know that Lucifer fell, and I would direct you to watch my video on Lucifer and what made him fall. Oh, my thoughts on it anyway, and um, you can check out that video if you want if you're interested. As humans, uh, it's really hard for us, especially as Christians, to understand how angels who regularly saw God, how they interacted with him, how how it is that they could possibly not want to be in God's presence or think that they could do better than God. This is really baffling, especially for Christians, until we start going a little bit deeper. Now, God wanted every cognizant, conscious being that he created to love him. In order to truly love, you have to have the option to not love. And I've also talked about this in previous videos, uh, especially in the series uh, entitled The Plan. So if we're created to be in a loving relationship with God, in order to truly have a choice to love, you have to have a choice to not love. The way God orchestrated choice was by creating a boundary. And of course, in the Garden of Eden, the boundary was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from that tree. That was the boundary. You could eat from any, 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 any other tree. Anything else was open for you. It was all fair game. But if you ate from this one tree, the day that you eat it, you will surely die. That's what, that's what Adam was told. Now we know that Adam did not die on that day. I'm just going to do a little sidebar here about Adam and Eve in the garden. In Genesis chapter 2, we see the story of how God created the woman. And this woman actually is a type of the church who is being built. Before God created the woman out of Adam's rib, out of his side, 
he had Adam name the animals. And so Adam did. And as he's doing this, all of a sudden, he realizes that animals have mates and there is nobody for him. There's nobody. He is all alone. He is the only one of his kind. He's the only one of his kind. And this incredible loneliness, this feeling of lack, is, is becomes now a part of who Adam is as a person. This is like something that is all of a sudden the, at the front of his mind and this hole in his heart where he realizes he he's supposed to have somebody just like the animals have a mate. He's supposed to have one too, but where is she? Where is she? And so God causes a deep sleep, and this is a picture of death, of Christ's death, and out of um, Adam's wounded side, he takes a, a portion of Adam, and then he begins to add to that rib and create the woman. And when Adam saw the woman, he said, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He realized that this was his other half, that this woman was what was going to, in, in many ways, complete him and make him whole. And I don't want to say that this is exactly like Christ, but there is something about a longing in the heart of Christ for people who are going to be like him, okay? People who will be glorified, people who will be brought into heaven and be like him. In Genesis chapter 3, though, the serpent comes and tempts Eve. Eve takes the fruit. She's deceived by the serpent into thinking that um, she wouldn't die, that she'd be like God and be wise and so on. And the fruit looked good and it was looked like it'd be good to eat. And so she took it and then she gave some to her husband. And he ate. And the Bible attributes sin to Adam because he knew what he was doing when he took the fruit. He, he knew what was going to happen. The sentence for crossing that boundary into eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the sentence was death. It was a death sentence. Now, a lot of us think that, oh, Eve should have just, you know, dropped dead <laughs> at that moment. And Adam, too, they should have both just dropped dead. And that isn't the case. It was the death penalty that they would receive. Why would Adam knowingly take the fruit and in doing so, giving himself the death sentence? Why would he do that? Well, I have one answer, and it's just one perhaps of many, but Adam would remember what it was like when he was all alone, when it was just him and nobody else. And then God creates this beautiful woman to be his partner, and it's wonderful. Life is great. It's good because she's there. And now she's eaten from the fruit and she is under the death sentence. Well, what Adam decided is that he would rather die than live a life without her. And in that way, too, I think that Adam is a type of Christ. That Christ demonstrates his love for us in that he was willing to die for us so that he could have us. So that's all a sidebar on this topic. But God wants us to ha to love him. Jesus wants us to love him. And love must be of our own accord. It has to be freely given. And there has to be a way that we can get out of not loving God if we want to. And that goes for the angels as well. Love for God would be demonstrated by obedience to him. And mostly it's just by not doing something. In the case of Adam, just don't eat from that tree. You're good. You're golden as long as you don't eat from that tree. And 
The angels have something very similar too. It's not that they have to do a bunch of really awesome things. It's just that there are boundaries. There is a boundary that's set up just like Adam and Eve had the boundary marker of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the boundary that if you cross it, it's the death penalty. And angels also have boundaries in their world, things they can't do, that if they were to cross over into another area where God drew a boundary line and they were to do that thing, then that would be uh, how they would show that they are in rebellion and how they don't want to love and serve and obey him. And remember, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. The commands are our boundary markers. Now, in the beginning, Christ was the one who created the world. God the Father and the Holy Spirit, of course, were working with Christ and they were all doing this together. This is all part of a common plan that they have. Colossians 1, 15 and 16 tells us that Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So when Christ set up the thrones and dominions and rulers and authorities, he set up the system that he would use to govern creation, not only the creation of the earth, but also these systems artwork in heavenly places, okay, in heaven. I want to take a look at a verse that talks about fallen angels, and in particular, the fallen angels of Genesis 6, the sons of God who mated with human women, and they crossed over a boundary. And those angels who did that are in chains in the bottomless pit or in Tartarus. Here's the verse that talks about overstepping boundaries. Jude verses 6, 8, and 9. And the angels who did not stay within their own domain, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in eternal chains under darkness, bound for judgment on that great day. In verse 8, in the same way as those angels who abandoned their proper dwelling in their own domain, there are people who defile their bodies. They reject authority and slander glorious beings. And verse 9, we're going to talk about an angel who did not overstep the boundaries. But even the archangel Michael, when he disputed with the devil over the body of Moses, did not presume to bring a slanderous charge against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. All right, so we have boundaries here. We're talking about boundaries and overstepping boundaries. So how did those fallen sons of God who mated with human women that we read about in Genesis 6, what does this passage in Jude tell us about overstepping boundaries? Well, number one, they didn't stay in their own domain. What is the domain of angels? Well, it's heaven. <laughs> That's their domain. That's their realm of existence, not earth. They weren't created for the earth. Of course, they can um, move back and forth between heaven and earth, but that does not mean that this is their domain, that they are to have any kind of dominion here on earth. And it says they abandoned their proper dwelling. Okay, this word dwelling is only used one other place in the New Testament, and that is in reference to our resurrection, immortal, glorified bodies, our permanent dwellings that are being kept in heaven. So what happened with these angels is they left their heavenly domain, their place of dominion in the heavens, and they abandoned their proper dwelling, that is their proper body. They decided they would take on the uh, an earthly type body and abandon their celestial body in, in favor of being able to act as men here on earth. And these uh, beings who did that, they're being kept in chains. This was such a violation of the boundary that God had for them. In verse 8, 
talking about both fallen angels and false teachers. It says that these uh, dreamers defile their bodies and they reject authority. And I was very curious about um, what it means to reject authority. The word reject there is uh, Strong's number 114, atheteo. And I'm just going to read you pieces of the definition here. It's to unplace, to do away with, to reject what has already been laid down, to set aside or disregard as spurious, as unnecessary, to nullify something or make it void, to break faith, to remove out of an appointed or proper place, to reject something as being invalid. It doesn't, you know, it's not for me. I don't have to do that. To cancel, annul, or abrogate, to disregard, pass over, or refuse to acknowledge. All of those are words um, that sort of fill out the definition for what it means to reject authority. Basically, what the angels did was they understood that God had a boundary here, that even though you may have a human body with which to interact with uh, humans when you have a job, a message, or whatever to deliver to human people, this body is not meant for you to use in procreation. It was possible and okay, not um, going past a boundary for angels to eat or for angels to drink or to walk or uh, talk or any of that stuff that people do in human bodies, but it was against the rules for them to use it to procreate. That was overstepping their boundaries. And in fact, in the beginning, God said that everything reproduces after its kind. Everything on earth reproduces after its kind. Angels are created individually, and they are not, uh, they don't reproduce after their kind. That is a phenomenon that's relegated to the things of the earth. So when these angels decided that they would leave their heavenly domain and that they would take on an earthly body and inhabit this domain, they totally um, abrogated the the command that God had given, the boundary that he'd set up. So when we talk about overstepping a boundary, that's really the essence of sin, is overstepping a boundary, that God has put a boundary in place, and you decide that it's not a good boundary, or you take it upon yourself to go, well, that one doesn't count, or that's, you know, has nothing to do with me, and so I don't, I don't need to follow that. Well, that's overstepping a boundary that God has put in place. And this is basically lawlessness at work. Now, the Archangel Michael in this passage in Jude is an example of an angel who did not overstep his boundary. And that's the reason why this little deal about Michael and Satan disputing over the body of Moses, that is the reason why this passage is put in this this chapter here is because uh, Jude is talking about angels and people who overstep boundaries, and he's talking about how Michael didn't overstep boundaries. He knew his place, and, and he did not go past it. So Michael's role is not that of a judge or of an accuser, and that is why he did not rebuke Satan. Okay, this is what it says. Uh, verse 9 of Jude. But even the archangel Michael, when he disputed with the devil over the body of Moses, did not presume to bring a slanderous charge against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Michael did not slander even Satan. This is really curious. It's, it's really amazing. Michael knew exactly what his job was, and he didn't go beyond it. And he knew that Satan was in the wrong, but he wasn't the one who was going to bring that slanderous charge. He just said, the Lord rebuke you. <laughs> okay, I, this is the Lord's business, is to accuse you and to judge you and to rebuke you. I am not going to do that. 
but I'm here to do what, what I was told to do. So both angels and men can overstep their bounds. And the fallen sons of God, the ones uh, from Genesis 6 who overstep their boundaries, they're currently being kept in the lowest part of the pit um, in Tartarus. And Satan uh, is also a fallen angel, and he overstepped his bounds. His um, authority originally was over the earth, to have dominion over the earth. And I've done a video on that in the um, Plan of God series, and so I'm not going to talk about that. But I go over all the scriptures that speak about how Lucifer was in Eden, the Garden of God, in the beginning, that he was on the mountain of God, that he exercised dominion over the earth until he fell. Once Satan fell, he was demoted. He no longer had dominion over the earth. And in fact, when God created um, man, Adam and Eve, he gave dominion to mankind who was made in his image. So Satan must be really bummed about that and really angry too that dominion over the earth was transferred from him to people. Second Peter chapter 2 uh, verses 4, 9, and 11. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell. He committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. So when the sons of God fell and created all these hybrid non-people people, people <laughs> that were destroyed in the flood, God took those fallen sons of God. They weren't actually judged, but they were placed in a, in a holding place. In verse 10, he talks about... Um, the specific sin of the fallen angels as well as false teachers and what characterizes them. Remember, it's not necessarily doctrine. It's about character. Uh, he says, and especially those uh, people and angels who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power than, than men, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. And again, this is going back to um, Michael, the good angel, who did not blaspheme against Satan, even though Satan is a, was a fallen angel and wicked. He left that for the Lord. So there's a lot in common between Second Peter chapter 2 and, and um, the book of Jude. Now, I want to talk a little bit about why. Why would the angels fall into sin? So I think in the beginning, it was Satan that fell. I think he was the first one. I think Satan, Lucifer, fell first. And he was able to deceive or persuade other angels to go over to his side. And the big question is, is why would they believe him? Why would, why would they believe that? Lucifer or Satan is the one to follow. Well, there's this passage that sort of came to mind when I was thinking about this topic, and that's Ecclesiastes 8.11. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Now, this is uh, talking about people and about how when people sin, they don't get the penalty right away and because they don't they think they just got away with something and i think this is actually a, a principle of evil it's part of the deception that goes with sin and evil and overstepping boundaries is because the sentence is not executed right away satan wasn't cast into the lake of fire right away Adam and Eve didn't die that day. There was actually a blood sacrifice that took their place. This animal that died so that they could be clothed, have atonement. Okay, something had to die on the day that Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden tree, and that was a substitute, a lamb. And they were clothed with the skin of the lamb. Satan and the fallen angels, they didn't have a, a covering. They didn't have any kind of atonement for them. There, there is no way that that can happen for them because of the principles of um, how this is, was set up in the beginning of a substitutionary blood atonement, that the blood 
is what uh, pays for sin. And of course, angels uh, in their spiritual heavenly state don't have, uh, they can't die. They, they don't die. They don't have a body that has uh, blood and so on. So there is no covering for their sin. And when Lucifer fell, he wasn't immediately judged. He wasn't immediately cast into the lake of fire. Now questions arise about God. Certainly he had the power to create everything, but does he have the power to hold it? Does he actually have uh, an intention to judge angels and put them into the lake of fire? Or is that just a lot of talk with no real teeth behind it? So I think these are all principles that that work not only in the earthly realm, but also in the spiritual realm with angels that because Satan was not judged, it may be that God has power to create, but he doesn't actually have all the power that he needs to hold on to his creation. It may also mean that God is unwilling. He's unwilling to judge his creation, the fallen angels, and so on. Because Satan was merely demoted. He was demoted from being having dominion over the earth to being the prince of the power of the air okay he he got a demotion but he wasn't he wasn't judged he wasn't cast into the lake of fire and this has been going on for thousands of years now where this is his position and he may think and this is part of self-deception he may think and have caused other fallen angels to believe the same thing, that God either has no intention of actually judging them in the lake of fire, or that he is unable to do that, that he doesn't actually have the power to be able to, to do that. And in a, another video, um, I think expressing the inexpressible, I talked about how God ha has parts of his character and nature that cannot find expression except that there are fallen beings like patience for example you don't have patience with perfection when when it was just the father son and the holy spirit in eternity living together patience was a part of their nature but it wasn't necessary because nobody ever did anything that frustrated anybody else within that divine community and so patience only has meaning uh, as it comes to dealing with others um, who have issues and we have to actually forbear them. We have to set aside our own <laughs> feelings of being frustrated or whatever and forbear. So patience and forbearance, long suffering, uh, gentleness, kindness, and even self-control, the self-control that um, would, was required of God to not immediately execute judgment on Satan. These are all aspects of God's nature that only really can be expressed in a fallen world. And self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. That means that God has self-control. That means that there are things that he may want to do, that he waits to do, that he exercises control over himself to allow something to play out all the way to the end before he does what he's going to do. And these are all aspects uh, of God's character and nature that can be seen as being negative. Certainly in the world around us, in, a, in the fallen world we live in, if you don't, you know, fight back, if you don't push back immediately, or if if you're kind and you turn the other cheek or you're willing to be wronged, people see that as, as weakness. They see that as weakness. And that should give us a clue that this is probably a universal. That if men see this as a weakness in other men, and even in God, 
that perhaps the fallen angels see it as a weakness as well. We know from what we read in the prophetic scriptures, Revelation chapter 12, that there is going to be a war in heaven between Satan and Michael. And we know that Michael and his angels are eventually going to win that battle. They're going to win that war. And for the first time since the fall of Satan, uh, who knows how many ages ago, Satan and his fallen angels will no longer be in heaven. Satan will no longer have access to the throne of God to accuse us before God. It will be, I think, a great relief for God and for the the holy angels to finally have Satan and his group out of there. But once Satan is cast to the earth and all of his fallen angels are cast to the earth as well, um, it will look like a victory um, over evil from heaven's perspective. But once Satan goes, you know, breaks through the atmosphere along with his fallen angels, I think he's going to make it look glorious. And I think he is going to take back the rulership, the dominion of the earth through his false son, through the Antichrist, through the beast. And Revelation 13 tells us that the dragon gives the beast his power, his throne, and his very great authority. And there are certain boundaries that even Satan is not able to overstep. And one of those boundaries is that a man, (laughs) someone who is um, a descendant of Adam, has to have dominion over the earth. And so um, that is the purpose of the beast, who is a man. He has the number of a man. He is also going to have the spirit of Apollyon. When the beast dies, when he's killed, and when he rises from the dead, he will be indwelt by the spirit of Apollyon, that angel who's the king of the angels of the bottomless pit. So he's, a, he's an extremely high status angel, and that angelic spirit is going to go into the body of the Antichrist. So the seventh king will become the eighth king when he rises from the dead. And then Satan will give this man, the beast, his power, his throne, and his authority. And the dragon, Satan, will be um, the fake God the Father, and the one who is in control of the earth. So in some ways, Satan will have not only regained dominion over the earth through his um, fake son, the Antichrist, but he will be in the position of God receiving worship because people will worship the dragon, especially the earth dwellers, the, the hybrids will be worshiping the dragon. So how this affects the end times is that we know that All of the fallen angels will be on earth, including the ones that are in Tartarus right now. They will all be on the earth in in full display during the end times. And their goal is to be on the earth. We think that everybody and all angels should want to be in heaven, but for some reason, the earth seems to be the prize and they want the earth. And that's what they are going to do. They are going to attempt to take over the earth and to hold it. Now, it will look like God has had the victory um, through Michael in heaven, and most Christians will already be in heaven. And actually, by the time the beast begins to reign, most people, just regular people, will, will be dead. A huge percentage of them will be dead. And massive numbers of them will have been martyred and be present in heaven. And because the population of the earth is so low, as far as people goes, it will look like um, the fallen angels can keep the earth, that this can be theirs, and that God has, you know, sort of divvied it up where, you know, the heaven dwellers, God and the heaven dwellers get heaven and Uh, Satan and the beast and the earth dwellers, the non-human hybrid types, get to keep the earth. Okay, now the thing is, is this was all made by Christ for himself, and he wants it all, and 
he has the power to um, subdue Satan and the all of his fallen creatures, fallen angels, and he actually has power and authority over death, over death and Hades. So there's a lot of self-deception that's going on with fallen angels, and it's the same self-deception that we see with false teachers. It's an overstepping of boundaries, and it's characterized by a very willful abandonment of any kind of propriety or boundary. And there is a heavenly version with the angels and it does have an earthly counterpart with false teachers. So I hope this provided some grist for the mill, some food for thought. And um, I hope you've enjoyed this series. And if you do, I hope you'll share it with somebody else and uh, give it a like and leave a comment. So we'll see you on another video. Till then, have a blessed day.